Hello and welcome to another episode of Making Stuff Look Good in Unity. With all the recent hype surrounding Pokemon, I thought it might be fun to recreate a visual effect from the Pokemon series. Dating all the way back to the first Pokemon games, the start of every battle has been marked by alarming music, a few screen flashes, and then some variation of a screen wipe to pull you into the encounter. Over the years, the screen transitions have become a lot more dazzling and have even featured special effects that occur for just one legendary encounter. Let's take a closer look at a battle transition from Pokemon Fire Red for the Game Boy Advance. As the battle with Brock begins, the screen does two quick flashes before it's flooded by triangles from the edges of the screen. Once the game is loaded into the battle, the screen opens up vertically from the center. So how might we go about recreating these scene transitions? Well, one approach might be animating a bunch of rectangles that obscure the camera, but it's a bit clunky, and it's not very flexible if we want to do different transitions for different encounters. Let's approach this with a shader instead, and see what we can come up with. We know our shader is going to need some value which controls how far along the transition is. We'll call this our cutoff. The next question is, what do we compare this value to? Picture a very simple screen wipe transition that comes in from the left of the screen. To create this, we could simply compare our cutoff value to the X position of the screen in UV coordinates. If the X position is less than the cutoff, we return a fixed color. Otherwise, return the color sampled from the texture, which in this case will be the contents of the screen. We'll do a familiar graphics.blitz setup, passing our source render texture contents through a material to the destination. The shader itself will be relatively simple, passing data from the vertices along as usual, and comparing the UV coordinates X value to our cutoff value. As I said a second ago, lesser values map to a fixed color, otherwise we just sample the main texture. In our scene, we can test out the shader by adjusting the cutoff slider on the material. It's a nice and simple transition, and we could maybe write another version that compares Y positions to create the opening up from the center transition, but creating that angular pattern seen in this battle against Brock would be pretty unwieldy. So we need another way of determining when a pixel should be cut off other than its XY position. Let's try a different strategy for our screen wipe. Instead of comparing the X position of the pixel, we'll encode when each value should be cut off in a texture. A gradient that goes from black to white as we go from left to right will basically encode the same values as our UV X position. So now in our fragment shader, we'll sample from this new texture and take one of the color components to compare to the cutoff value. Previewing this in our scene, we can see the screen wipe looks virtually identical to the UV version. But what if we fed in another texture, say one that looks like this? Noise! There's no need for additional shader code, we can just swap out the texture to get a completely different transition. Now, how about a texture that looks like this? Heck yes, this one works too, but there's just one small oddity you might have noticed here. In the texture that controls this transition, the darkest pixels, and therefore the ones that should be cut off first, are up here in the top left corner. Yet in our scene, the bottom left pixels are cut off first. And it gets even weirder, check out what happens when we disable anti-aliasing in the quality settings. What? This curious behavior is actually a platform-specific rendering difference. Render textures on Direct3D-like platforms and OpenGL-like platforms have different conventions for what the top and bottom coordinates of render textures are. Unity typically corrects for this, except when multi-sample anti-aliasing is enabled. I'll put a link in the description to where you can read more about this rendering quirk. But here's the fix. We'll create two sets of UV coordinates in our vertex shader. One which we'll use to sample from the main text, and another we'll use to sample from other textures. The second set will be flipped depending on the platform and MSAA settings. Our angular pattern is now correctly oriented and our transition is looking pretty good. Using coroutines or animations, you can control the values of the transition material over time, and load your battle scene or move your camera position in between the transition in and the transition out. You can experiment with all sorts of different grayscale patterns to get various effects. Here's one I came up with that paints a Pokeball in a circle. Combined with a screen flash and the pre-battle fanfare, it fits right into the game. In Pokemon Fire Red, there's another effect sometimes seen in the screen transition, specifically when encountering a Pokemon in the wild. The black bars that cross the screen seem to push the pixels in front of them off to the side as they clear the screen. We've done lots of screen distortions in my videos, so we'll go with my usual shtick of encoding offsets as red and green values. This eyesore of a texture has 160 horizontal lines, the same pixel height as the Game Boy Advance. Interleaving lines go from blue value 0 to 255, and 255 to 0 every other line. 
but each line's red value is either 0 or 255, indicating directionality left or right. The green value is 128 in every pixel, so as not to encode any Y offset. Back in our shader, we'll add a material property called Distort, and give it the Material Toggle attribute. This just means the field appears as a tick box in the inspector. Unticked means a value of 0 or false, and ticked means a value of 1 or true. In our fragment program, we'll grab the normalized direction of the offset if distort is enabled. Now, when we sample the screen contents, we'll offset by the cutoff value multiplied by the offset direction. This means that the closer a pixel is to being cut off, the more it is pushed in the direction. Testing out the transition with that super ugly texture, we get a transition that is pretty close to how it looks in the game. I'll note that the character sprites seem to be handled on a separate layer that is only affected by cutoff and not by distortion. I can't think of a particularly nice way of doing that at the moment. It would likely involve a multi-camera setup, or maybe by having character sprites write to some additional do not distort buffer. These textures are a bit more complicated to produce than the grayscale variants, but the directionality allows for some pretty cool looking effects. Pokemon also occasionally uses a simple fading transition, usually when entering or exiting buildings. I went ahead and added another material property to control the fade, and then in the fragment shader, where we previously returned a flat color, we instead return an interpolated value between the main texture sample and the color property. Now when we want to fade in or out, we can just keep the cutoff value at 1 and use the fade value to control the full screen fade. I actually used the fade to create the pre-transition screen flashes as well. Compared to a kludgy set of shapes filling the screen or a convoluted set of if statements, this method of making various screen transitions gives us a lot of flexibility. Best of all, it's super easy to experiment with. Just create some sort of pattern as a grayscale image and check out how it looks in your game. So whether you're making an RPG and need some cool battle transitions, or you just want to jazz up the way you shift between menu screens in your game, hopefully this shader will come in handy. I'll drop a link in the description containing the shader, as well as several of the image files I used for the effects in this video. If you've got some visual element from a game you'd like to see covered in a future video, leave me a comment about it. I won't necessarily get to it right away, but I'm keeping a running list of every game and effect mentioned to me for future videos, so thanks to anyone who's made a suggestion so far. A special thanks goes out this week to all my patrons on Patreon. You the best. And as always, thank you all for watching, keep on making those video games.